That's probably good, Alan, don't you think? Probably good. Throw it out to the right. Yeah. Yeah. dive operator or anybody who's lived in South Florida long enough will say, yeah, there's by far less coral on the reefs than there were back in the 60s and 70s. There's no doubt that the reefs in the Florida Keys in the past oh, 20 to 30 years have seen a tremendous decline in coral cover. One thing we know, when the water gets really warm really quickly, corals often suffer and oftentimes the corals will bleach, they lose their symbiotic zooxanthellae. A lot of scientists are worried about an increase in sea temperatures having this effect on coral reefs. In the Caribbean and in Florida, the Elkhorn and the Staghorn coral are the two most important corals that have built the reefs here. And over the last 30 years, they have been wiped out almost 90%. When I discovered this hybrid elkhorn staghorn coral, a hybrid of two endangered species living in such an industrial environment in the main shipping channel of government cut on an artificial rock substrate, I mean, it changed everything in my brain. Maybe everything that I had learned about corals being so absolutely delicate, maybe this isn't really always the case. Seeing that sort of caused me to explore further. And I began finding corals literally all the way into downtown, around the mouth of the Miami River, anywhere that the corals had uh, solid rock or you know, trash opportunity to grow on, you could generally find corals there. The urban corals that Coral Morphologic has put in the spotlight here in Miami. They're here because of the unique situation where we have coral reefs offshore and a bay that has been dredged to encourage intrusion of, of the seawater. It's just the nature of coral reproduction. When they produce larvae, the larvae are free-floating in the water, and wherever they settle, they have to grow. If, if they can't tolerate it, they die. Uh, if they can, they thrive. And so this special habitat in the city of Miami selects for hardy strains. What's special about them is those corals can be utilized for reef restoration. They can be propagated and put out on the reef where corals have died by and large. There is a greater emphasis within the world of mainstream science to identify unhealthy corals in presumably healthy environments. That's important work, it needs to be done, but you're missing out on what I think will unlock more secrets is to find the healthiest corals in the most unhealthy environments and look at those corals. But reefs have been around a really long time. And uh, fortunately, as long as those bleaching events aren't back to back year after year, they recover really quickly. 
what's happening globally now in some places. There, there are reefs that are, are not doing so well. What can be done about that? Making sure that industry is not doing things that are harming reefs, whether it be dredging or polluting in, in one fashion or another. Out behind us, we've got two enormous dredge ships that are working 24-7. They started in December 2013, and they're slated to continue until July 2015. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers is expanding the government cut to allow for the larger ships coming in from the Panama Canal expansion. We identified very early on that government cut was a critical part of what makes Miami this coral lab. But as it turns out, as we discovered, corals have started to colonize government cut itself. Just the fact that these corals are living in a man-made, disturbed environment, healthy, creating a, a, what has become a natural coral reef community, these are essential for research purposes. No coral should be smothered or blasted or anything. Our primary interest, of course, is just to try and look out after the best interest of these corals. So when you learn about, oh, there's gonna be a major dredge project where they're gonna go another eight feet deeper, we had to start planning in advance. As the rules of the permit were written, the Army Corps of Engineers, who is in charge of the dredge project, they had to remove all corals larger than 10 inches. But that means that there's thousands of corals that are of a small size. And these are the corals generally adapt better to you know, aquarium conditions and then being able to grow them in, in a laboratory. Corals are incredibly protected organisms. You can't just go out and take coral. So they present this as, these are corals of opportunity. It's an opportunity for researchers to be able to go out and collect them. We were given four days to get ready. You know, May 26th, Memorial Day, that's when we start. And by the way, unfortunately, the Army Corps needs to continue on with their dredging, and you only have until June 6th. So that gave us 12 days. That was the hand that we were dealt. And, you know, we've done an incredibly good job given the circumstances. Incredibly proud of diving with Alan, my assistant. Did an amazing job. rescued a lot of corals. Now we're transplanting them to this artificial reef. So we're out here on the Port of Miami Mitigation Reef, which we have dubbed Cosmic Reef. And so this is where we have permission from them to be able to transplant the corals that we rescued out of government cut. And so we're gonna go down and we are going to use a, an underwater two-part epoxy to secure the corals onto the rocks, and uh, the corals will eventually be able to grow down naturally as if they've always been here. It's an artificial reef that was built 20 years ago, left to its own devices to naturally recruit corals. And the diversity of this reef rivals anything else in the natural reefs near or around Miami. You're not happy about the nature of the dredging. It, it really sucks. So the water out here, it, it looks beautiful. Turquoise, as far as I can see, but actually, really, you can't see much further than about three to five feet in the water from the amount of silt that's just caught up in the water column from all of the dredging. Silt is something that really stresses corals out because they're constantly having to shed it off. They have to create mucus. We thought that Cosmic Reef was going to be you know, protected from this silt. Now we're finding during this dredge that even this reef is being impacted by all of the silt in the sediment. Based on the reports that we're reading from the Army Corps themselves, the sediment 
meters that they set up are not functioning. So if you don't have functioning equipment, and they admit that they don't have any plans to replace them with functioning equipment, it's like, who's accountable for that? Now we have to continue to work to make sure that ongoing, that they're not stressed out. This is what we're here for. To look after these corals that Miami has that nobody else was really paying any attention to. Miami is, it used to be a coral reef. The highest elevation in Miami is Cutler Ridge. Cutler Ridge is a fossilized coral reef. So if it was a fossilized coral reef, then at one point of time it was underwater. So Miami's been underwater in the past. Miami Beach was formed on a limestone ridge that runs along the eastern shoreline. The entire western side of the island was mangroves that have been filled in with dredged material from the bay. When the developers came in in the late 1800s, early 1900s, they began filling in the island. In the 1970s, we had the Beach Restoration Project, which was funded by the Army Corps of Engineers. Basically, the entire eastern side, even though it was lined with hotels, there wasn't a beach. They dredged sand from offshore and pumped it to create the beaches. These islands are all dredge spoil islands. I'm the environment and sustainability manager with the city and I work on all environmental issues and that's everything from helping manage the beaches to protecting the city's waterways. And you know, I think a city like Miami Beach, um, it's all man-made. It's, you know, very little natural environment, but that's why it's important for the natural environment that we've created to protect it. It's amazing. It's just amazing how vulnerable we are. We have no idea how fast ice can disintegrate. I'm Harold Wanless. I'm professor and chair of the Department of Geological Sciences at the University of Miami. Every year, we're finding out new things about ice that's making us realize that it's accelerating faster than any of our models or any of our anticipations had suggested. Our sea level doesn't work like this when, we, when some aspect of climate and some ice sheet goes unstable. There's a rapid disintegration and a rapid collapse. And that's what we should be preparing for. And we're not. All our models don't know how to include ice disintegration. Back in 2007, we put out a forecast for Miami-Dade County that we would probably have three to five feet of sea level rise this century, which puts Miami in a very serious situation. But with the information that's come out this year, we're probably looking at more like seven to 10 feet or more by the end of this century. And that's absolutely shocking. It's over, you know, it's simple as that. Sea level rise, climate change is definitely recognized here in Miami Beach and we're planning for it. We're designing for two feet over the next uh, 2060 and that's flexible. We're using the sea level rise projections developed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and they're getting their data from NOAA, uh, the USGS. We already have serious flooding coming on to Miami Beach at present level. In September especially, we get these high tides that back up through the drains and you watch the cars on Miami Beach drive through this and they think it's because it was raining. No, this is seawater. We're planning to construct pumps throughout the city to help pump floodwaters. But we're also looking at natural approaches by, you know, creating stormwater retention areas, improving our dune system, and also looking at seawall heights. 
we sit on an amazingly porous limestone or out on the barrier islands here on a porous sand. You can build all the dikes you want. It might keep out a storm surge, but it won't keep out water coming in underneath and flooding. And the biggest problem, we've created the monster of a warmed ocean. And that's going to drive melting ice on Antarctica and Greenland for probably centuries. We're at enough CO2 in the atmosphere now that we should be around 80 feet more sea level rise. We haven't faced up with reality yet. I, I don't know if we will. But if we wait too long, we won't be able to sell our houses because we can no longer get insurance, and we will not have the tax base to help people. And then we'll be begging the federal government. It's important that the governments, city, county, state, federal, stop pouring money into building new infrastructure in places that probably won't be functional within 50 years. A worst case scenario is a storm. You know, that's really something that's going to come quickly and have the biggest impact to our city. If we were to be hit by a hurricane, it would be catastrophic. Right now, we're looking at addressing the solution by keeping all of the city of Miami Beach. We're not looking to abandon parts of the city. However, in the future, depending on the rate of sea level rise, that may have to be a solution. We may have to abandon parts of the city. You know, we're going to see the cityscape change, but I'm very hopeful that it's going to change in a you know, better way. And um, yeah, we'll, I guess we'll see what happens. History will tell. Who knows what will happen? Will people abandon Miami Beach? I mean, if the sea level rises high enough, I guess we'll have to. Will Miami Beach become like a Venice for a while? And I mean, who knows? But surely as the sea level rises, there's going to be more of this man-made substrate for the corals to encrust. They will do what they've done before. Tonight is game four of the NBA Finals at the American Airlines Arena where the heat play is right here on the water. This is called the FEC Slip. It's the original Port of Miami. It's most recently where David Beckham proposed filling it in to build his stadium on top of. So we came out here a few weeks ago and scouted around the whole place and I found all kinds of different corals. This is probably about the most disgusting water that a person would want to go swimming in. going to explore one of my favorite urban coral habitats in Miami. We're just uh, inside North Biscayne Bay behind Alton Road. There's all kinds of different types of corals live here. It's a really, really cool urban coral spot. We can now document them and create a body of work on Miami's corals that represent the city. 
to create new icons for the city. I think the context in which they grow the corals makes it an art. There are aspects of narrative storytelling in the story of the city and the story of the corals. Our buildings are made out of coral, we're standing on coral, and one day coral will live here again. You're constantly aware of your mortality almost in that way, and like the corals are this memento mori or something where like from the ocean we came into the ocean we'll return. It's exciting, it's kind of depressing to talk about it, but it's also like very exciting. It means that potentially your actions here can have a bigger impact in determining the culture of the city if there's a finite amount of time for it to exist. 75% of people who live here were born someplace else, about 50% born in another country. We need connectors. Artists reflect what's happening to them, and they'll reflect the air and the water around us, and they'll reflect the changes in the society all around us. So I, I believe art will increasingly reflect what is happening in nature. Coral morphologic, I think, just happens to be a little bit ahead of the pack. To me, like the coral should be like our flag, should be our mascot, they should represent the city. These are living art forms themselves. And Miami is a city that is a coral city. If people have to leave Miami because it's not a reliable place to live, the corals will no doubt continue their march with the rising seas up onto dry land. You know, the idea of Miami becoming encrusted with corals, you know, on the bones of their ancestors, and all of the different unique ecosystems that could happen. You know, and think about it, it's like, wow, what if this was underwater, you know, what would, what would this look like?